It will. <laughs> All right. I ain't got to worry about that. I'm going to worry. All right. All right, we're going to see if you guys can identify these parts here. This is a parts identification thing. And we're going to start with that one right there. What is this? Well, you got 15 the, seconds. Gear. Crank sensor. Crank sensor electric wheel is the right answer, but good, good, good call. Crank sensor electric wheel. Crank sensor electric wheel. He can see it from way back there, so everybody else should be able to as well. Richard, just. All right. We got to go to the next one. What is this? Water pump. That ain't too hard to figure out, is it? All right. Let me get. Let me shoot it again. What is that? Uh, fuel. Kind of out of it. Yeah, it's a fuel. Uh, is it the ETR battery yeah. pouring too? Oh no! Did you go to UTI? Oh, no, no, no! I know what it is. It's fuel pressure regulator. Fuel pressure regulator. Okay. With all due respect to UTI, you know, I'm just kidding. All right. I said that. Yeah. What about this? What is this? This part right here. Idle retention. It's right behind the timing gear. It's right behind the electric gear for the crank system. The crankshaft is in here, but that's not the crankshaft. Take, you see that right there? Take, take your box away from it. The timing right gear? There? Huh? Can you take your box off of it? So uh, let, me move to the, let me move pump? to the next one. And then that moves the box. See it? Is that an oil pump? That is the oil pump. Okay. All right. What it's is old. this hole for? Spark plug. That's for a spark plug, because you can see a coil on the one right next to it. <coughs> All right, you got that? All right. What's this? Wait, wait. Basically, it's hitting me with the same one I did earlier. What's this for? The wheel for the cam. Uh, okay. The cam sensor reads that little bump when it goes by, doesn't it? All right. What is that? Uh, an injector. What? An injector? It's up under the intake. It's inside the intake. The injectors are somewhere else. That's not an injector. The injector right here. This is an injector right here. You can't even tell what it is, Richard. Yeah, I mean. What does it look like? A circle? A rocker arm, maybe? No, that's a rocker arm right there. Looks like my choke tube on my intake. Right there. Is it? There's another one next to it, and it's on the same shaft. This is a Intake manifold rudder control plate. Whenever you hit a certain RPM, it changes because if you've got long runners and short runners, see if you got long runners at idle, better if you got short runners, you got more power. And that was originally done on the uh, the first ones that I knew about it done on was on the 89 SHO Taurus that had that Yamaha engine. All right, what is that? That is a lifter because it's right there by the rocker arm. And who said this was a rocker arm? I can't believe that. What's this? <laughs> All right. Which is cylinder number one? That says cylinder number 12, but it's actually screwed up. Cylinder number one. Which one is it? How could you tell by looking at what you see here? You can look down here and tell. No, it ain't. I'm telling, I'm telling you, you wouldn't know if it was a four, if you didn't know what it was. How could you tell by looking at the crankshaft which one was number one? Yeah, how could you tell by looking down here? The front cylinder, the number one cylinder is always the front rod on the crankshaft. On a Chevrolet, the, number, the one that's coming over on this side is the front rod on the crankshaft. It has a tendency, you know, where so are the holes, the where are these holes at? So Engine health compression, static versus running. Now get ready to take your notes, okay? All right, everybody's done a compression test and has ever worked on an engine very much at all. And you kind of know it's not too tough, terribly hard to spin that thing and let it puff about five or six puffs and see where the needle goes. Now, occasionally you'll have a compression gauge that's got a Schrader valve that's not quite working right, and the needle won't go up there and hold the compression, it'll just bounce. We had one like that, didn't we? It was just bouncing. It's really annoying. But we want to cement the diagnosis. And I, one time we had this uh, F 150, it was a 98 model, it had a zillion miles on it, and it came in here and it was skipping on number five. We checked the compression, it had low compression on number five. 
and that particular one we went ahead and put a motor in it because on one of those motors by the time you pull the heads off and by the time you redo the heads and by the time you put all that time and chain junk on there you spent more than you'd spend putting a motor in it anyway. And we managed to find a motor, believe it or not, at LKQ for $600. What motor? It was a 4.6 and a 98 F-150. All right, so uh, in that, I don't know if you could find another one for $600, but we, didn't, we paid just 600 for that one. Now, that was one of the ones that they must have turned backwards when they was taking it out because they started it, they knew it was a good engine. When they sent it to us, it didn't have any compression because they had turned it backwards, taking the torque converter bolts out in it, you know, their torque converter nuts. Now, here's a bouncy vacuum gauge. I'm going to show you this little video right here. And, um, how far? Right now it is, yeah. <coughs> Let me back up. That, Let me back up on that thing. I think it wants me to, to do something here. That particular one. That one's not going to let us play that, but I'll show it to you at another. Well, I will tell you this. Let's not worry about watching that video because it's on your electude. You will get a chance to watch that. It's about an escort that had a bouncy gauge on it. Let me ask you this, while I'm thinking about a bouncy gauge. If I've got a bouncy vacuum gauge when it's sitting here idling and it's skipping and the vacuum gauge is bouncing, what does that mean? It's going bum, 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 just real rhythmic. It's bouncing with the skip. What is that telling you? Something wrong with a valve? Typically, but which valve would you think? Could it also be, could an exhaust valve come? It, it could be an exhaust valve, it could be holding the exhaust valve close to the cylinder. It comes up as blowing the exhaust back into the intake. Well, I've burned it. Burn it. Huh? Down. No, I mean it's yeah, it's bouncing down every time it, uh, you know. But I mean, could could a could a burned exhaust valve cause it to bounce? You? Okay. I mean, just tell me why. I'm again trying to see if you are just giving me a yes or no, or you can explain it. I understand an intake valve burn, right? So, but tell me why an exhaust valve would cause the intake. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying tell me. Well, if an exhaust valve. Back out of the exhaust instead of if it's got a place that it can pull air from the exhaust, it's not gonna, you know, it, it, it ain't gonna have vacuum in that cylinder, right? And that, every cylinder's vacuum is what gives you that. Because the intake valve's open, exhaust valve's closed, and it's pulling it down. All right, now just think about that for a minute. Dynamic compression test is really significant diagnostic tool, but you don't get to use very much. It can be used to pinpoint. A misfire when all the usual tests don't reveal the problem. You've done all the other tests and you don't really know why. You know, we got smacked around a little bit. <laughs> uh, we got all those ejectors clicking on that 4.8 liter that uh, Robert worked on. And we worried with it and we checked the compression. Initially when we checked the compression, it would have pretty good compression and then it'd have no compression. And then we would, you know, even took the gauge off and it didn't have nothing puffing out the spark plug hole. and. Uh, we, you know, did an oil change and put some sea foam in there and all that to wash it down, whatever. And we got compression on that cylinder. It went up to like, what, 175? Is that what you got, Robert? He got pretty good compression on it, but we were still skipping on that cylinder even after we cleaned all those injectors and everything. And so we had to backtrack and recheck some things. So we used the um, injector flow thing, and we went in there. Whenever we uh, tried to get, you know, to check the fuel pressure using the injector flow tester, it didn't drop any pressure even though the injector was clicking it wasn't squirting any fuel so we had to replace the injector with an 86 hour injector and we got that straightened out all right so static compression and cylinder leak down just checks how well leak cylinder is sealed against compression loss so you got your uh, you know you can be what you do is when you, you know, there is a, a sheet on this by the way but you put your uh, compression leak leakage tester in there you, and you put this thing on top dead center with both of the valves closed and while you got both the valves closed, you go ahead and put pressure in there, and it's going to tell you what percentage of leakage you got. Of course, you got to calibrate your tester before you hook the hose up to the you know, cylinder. You're basically going to have the hose that you feed air into the cylinder completely off there, so no leakage is at the tool, and you turn the regulator until it's saying zero leakage when you put it on there. If you find leakage, you got to have the cylinder top dead center, both valves closed. Now, if you have the rocker arms off, you can do it that way. But basically what we wound up with is a situation, um, if you can hear the air going out the intake, you know it's a 
a uh, intake valve problem. If you hear it, see it bubbling into the coolant, you know you basically got a head gasket issue. If you hear it coming out an adjacent cylinder, you know, see what I'm saying? You can tell if you can tell where the air is going out the exhaust, out the intake, wherever you can tell. If it's coming out the PCV valve into the crankcase, you know, you're basically looking for looking at rain or piston problems and all that. Well, you can connect your vacuum gauge and manage your manifold vacuum to determine an engine's capacity to breathe, but that doesn't typically pinpoint which cylinder may have a problem. Now, you should be writing down answers right now because some of those are on that. A running compression test provides the quality of particular cylinder volumetric efficiency. A running compression test provides the quality of a cylinder, particular cylinder volumetric efficiency. Somebody tell me what volumetric efficiency is. What's volumetric efficiency? Did you you didn't get a test, did you? Sorry about that. You're watching that. Huh? How much air is pumping out? Well, how much air it's able to process. And when the air is going in there, it's having to go around curves. And when it's going in there fast, you're not going to have on a three liter engine, unless it's supercharged or turbocharged, you're not going to have a hundred percent of volumetric efficiency. Now, how many of you guys have been around hot rod stuff and know what we're talking about when we're talking about port and polishing heads? What's the purpose in that? The more air that can go in, the more it can come out. Yeah. So basically. Well, the more air you can get in, the harder, the more fuel you can put in, which means the more time you can put in. Yeah, so basically you're matching the runners up so there's nothing, so it's real smooth all the way through there. You know? However, if you take that manifold that came off that Mustang right up there, and you look in there, it's got some little runners that basically almost close off the air going in there. Now they open up when you've got more power, but it almost closes them off. I've actually held that up in front of the of people before, and you can actually operate it, and you see little flappers going, so it, it closes it off almost from, well, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to almost close it off? What would be the purpose of that? The important polishing is the best way to go. I mean, that way you ain't going to put as much fuel in as a hot one. Well, something else. What else happens whenever you put a restriction there? The air goes screaming in there really fast, doesn't it? I mean, so basically it's gonna, the air is going to pick up speed. You're going to get more turbulence. You're going to get better emissions at idle typically like that. The reason I've got that one, it came off of a brand new car. They were putting a supercharger in it. And so they had to pull that manifold off, put a supercharger on it, and they gave me the manifold up right before. Uh, but anyway, uh, so each cylinder is supposed to, everybody listening, watch your sheet. Each cylinder is supposed to pull air in, retain it for the correct amount of time, and then release it into the exhaust. That's what the cylinder is supposed to do, and the valves have got to be dancing with the piston to make that work. If a cylinder can't perform these functions properly, the result can be a loss of volumetric efficiency or a density misfire. You know, if you've got the air density is different from one stroke to the next, you're liable to have a misfire and you're liable to hear the pull, 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 pull. That can also be because of spark plugs and all. Okay, this is a chart. You're building a chart. This is for a four cylinder. Make sure your chart's got enough lines. A six cylinder would need six lines. And how many would an eight cylinder need? Eight. Eight lines. How many would a five cylinder need? How many would a 10 cylinder need? How many would a 9 cylinder need? All right. Yep, that's exactly right. Unless you got a 10 cylinder, it's not firing on one cylinder. <laughs> All right. So, you obviously start with a static compression test. Put those numbers in the column under static. Right? The static compression test, to, to, to prep, Robert, the compression test you did on all the cylinders, you're going to put that right here. Now, the next one over here, you're going to start the engine with your gauge in place and take idle readings while holding the engine at about 1,200 RPM, which is just above idle. Not really idle, it's just above idle, actually. But you do it anyway. Put those numbers in the idle column. So even now we filled in our idle column here. So we're going to have, you know, a fair percentage of this. What percentage of 160 is 75? Huh? Let me pause for a second. Well, it's almost 50%, a little under 50%. And then uh, uh, 175 and 80. You see if you're running about 50% when you're doing the idle thing? Now, let me ask you this. Why is a four valves per cylinder better than two valves per cylinder? That's more air in. Kind of like making biscuits, right? 
If you do it right, you can get more biscuits out of the dough if you stamp them right. Yeah. Okay. And the big valves are which ones? The bigger valves are big valve and bigger valves are intake. This is this he's turning into a serious engine guy yeah, since he's been working a little 77 unit already. All right. Put those numbers in the idle column. Snap the throttle to 2,500 RPM and release really quick, and the reading should rise. Resort, record the results. These numbers should be at least 80% of the static reading. See the problem here. Got that one, the yellow one. Notice how these are all like 80% of these, except that one is still way down. Okay, so what kind of problem is that going to be? All it says. The snap throttle. Bad load on a camshaft. No, which which load? The load on a camshaft. Which load? The, the exhaust. No, the intake. It had to be the intake if it was a rounded off load. That's a possibility. Have you ever have you ever guys heard a a, a engine run that had a load completely rounded off on a camshaft? What does it sound like? Sound like a machine gun in the intake. Bop, 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 every time it comes around. That was a really. Uh, my dad uh, bought a uh, Chevrolet Caprice one time. It had a 305 in it, and it was doing that. Bop, 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 and he got in a car for not much money. And uh, so me and him went and found a 350 camshaft, and we put it in there. So, you know, because the camshaft would run off, we had to put lifters in and all that kind of stuff. And boy, did that thing ever suck gas with that 350 cam. <laughs> I mean, it didn't, it didn't run like any, all that much better than it would have with a 305 cam. Yeah, it ran good enough to drive, but boy, it sucked gas big time. So if it's low, it's an intake, and if it's high, it's an exhaust? More likely. Look at that. If the snap, now we got a bunch of stuff it could be. Now look at this right here. If the snap reading is much below 80% cranking compression, it's not able to get the air it needs. Possible reasons would be a worn intake cam lobe, which is what you said. Intake valve carbon deposits. You can get carbon deposits that are so thick and so heavy that it, it that they actually slow the air down and it can't get enough air. That is the problem that's happening with a lot of the uh, gasoline direct injecting vehicles because they don't have that gas in there already washing the valves off. But the PCV system, all of that oil steam that floats around in the intake and Condenses and turns into all sludge. It does that too. Weak valve spring. See that valve spring right there that broke. Uh, worn valve guide. Rocker or push rod problems. Intake manifold runner valve issues. Anything that keeps it from getting the air that it's supposed to get can cause one of these low readings on the snap. You might notice that over here you didn't catch it. Right here you didn't catch it. Here's where you caught it. Now we were, I was in a drivability class up in Kansas City and the guys that were teaching it were really sharp and they had fixed a lot of cars, but one of them was uh, somebody from the back of the, I didn't say anything because they never even mentioned the snap part of this, but I was saying, uh, somebody from the back of the class said, aren't you supposed to snap it and take readings that way? And uh, they said, well, uh, we haven't ever done that. And I said, well, that's something that you're supposed to do because it actually talks about this and they give you tables like this that are filled out on your L1 test for ASE. Because it was on my L1 test the last time I re-upped on it. And uh, both of them looked at one and they said, well, it wasn't on our L1 test. And I said, well, they don't put every question on every test, you know. But the simple fact was that is something that's a, something you're supposed to do. If you're a real serious, now performance people do this to make sure that their vehicle's tuned right and breathing right. A snap measurement that's over 80% on one cylinder means the air is being improperly trapped when it ought to be leaving. Okay, so that's what that is. So look for exhaust restrictions, clogged catalytic converter or muffler, valve train issues. Remember the one I showed you the other day that had the clogged up exhaust runner? Worn exhaust cam load, collapsed exhaust valve lifter. All right. Hang on. Go back. All right. So Go back. There was only three bullet points there. And you flew through it. Yep. Bent exhaust valve push rod. Worn exhaust cam load. Collapsed exhaust valve lifter. One of those three. We should have done that on the Jeep. Yes. We could. We could have done it on the Jeep. That guy was, I, that guy's all about hot rodding that Jeep anyway. He wants to tweak it and make it better than, I mean, that's what, that's all he studies. You know what I mean? And you know, furthermore, the way we were doing it, if you don't know the truth about it, if you put the dial indicator on top of the uh, spring when it's, I mean, when the push rod, when it's also mashing the spring, 
you could have a lifter that's squishing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, if you're going to replace the lifters, you'll, you'll want that old, you'll usually find camshaft issues, especially because it doesn't have roller lifters in it. I don't believe that one just got flat. So what is, is that doing on uh, Yeah, he's going to bring it back next semester. If you get a low read and idle also on the snap test, the cylinder in question is leaking compression. If you get them both, see that? Idle and snap. You got dead or burnt valves, valve or valve seat. You can usually find that though. You're going to notice that. right? See this right here. You can have a good reading here, but have a bad one there. You see what I'm saying? So that's why it's important to go further than just that. If you wanted to, technically when you do the, the, uh, the static one, you're supposed to pull all the spark plugs out and hold the gas pedal all the way to the floor. So you can get all the air you can get if you do it right. Now some of us would just check the one, you know, in one place there. All right. I was working in a truck shop in the mid-80s for a while and drew a ticket on an international Lodestar 1600 gas burner with a misfire on cylinder number two. Okay, there was look one of these kind, you know what I'm saying? You fold the cow forward, you got the engine. I kind of like those because you can just step inside that tire and you just all you're standing there working on the engine like it's on engine stand. I always enjoy those. All right, so the number two cylinder had no compression at all. Here's a, another peculiarity. You know, some of these old international V8s, you timed it to cylinder number eight instead of one. You put your timing light on cylinder number eight instead of cylinder number one on some of those, which was, I always thought was weird. The only one I ever saw like that. Uh, but maybe the other ones, I don't know. So I had it all and tested it again. I got 180 PSI, got no compression. I went from no compression whatsoever to 180 PSI when I put oil in there. Well, I told the boss what I found, and he got permission to rebuild the engine. It belonged to a lumber yard. And they said, well, it's been five years since we rebuilt that motor anyway, so let's just go ahead and, you know, throw some rings and bearings in it and all that. And in the olden days, that's what we do a lot of times. You know, if you did it right, you'd bore it out and all that kind of stuff. And we throw rings and bearings in it on faith and usually get away with it, you know. In the days, unless it, you had a cellar, it was really bad. Worn, but anyway, I got the valve cover off. I found out what the problem was. What do you think it was? A rock wrong. Some yo-yo had floated a valve and dropped a push rod. The rocker arm was fine, but that push rod had come out and was laying down in the valley. It was the intake push rod. Why I said that? Because I had the same thing happen on the, you know, the old Ford has got the, the whole set of rocker arms on a, like a round tube, and it's got like four bolts to the round tube. Yeah, that's the way, that's the way these are set up. Yeah, well, anyway, it broke one end of the back end of that thing off, and it was doing the same thing. Yeah, when you put the oil in there, you bring it up. Why did putting the oil in there bring it up? Why did the compression increase with the oil added if the intake valve wasn't even open? It's going to. Huh? It's going to, because it ain't going to let as much pass the room. This is what's going on. Whenever... That valve is closed and they never open it up. And you go to take that piston down and it lowers the pressure in there. So see, it's all been purged out when the exhaust valve did open. So when this piston's going down, you're basically you got low pressure here and you've got atmospheric pressure out here. Believe it or not, that atmospheric pressure is enough to pull that valve open against this spring and you get a bunch of air in there that gets trapped and on the next compression stroke it comes up and squeezes it. And so basically, the, the, as strong as that spring is, you wouldn't think that would be able, it'd be able to do that. But that piston's got enough sucking force when you put that oil in there to work in the sucking valve open. So what did y'all do with the motor? That still doesn't make sense. I went back up front and I told the boss man at that shop, I says, look, we don't need to put it, uh, rebuild this motor. Uh, we, get, we need to put the push rod back in place and that may be all it needs. And he said, well... You know, basically with a lumber yard, it's like a tax write-off, and they told him to go ahead and rebuild it anyway, so we went ahead and rebuilt it. Um, but anyway, because see somebody been driving it that hard, you know, what's going on there. Uh, another little side uh, of that story, when I got it all put back together, um, the, the bearings were new and all of this stuff, uh, but the oil pressure was just a little bit low. And he'd already quoted them everything, and he didn't want to put an oil pump on it. And so I took the relief valve out of the oil pump and I took the spring out of there and I put some washers under the spring and I put the pin back in there to hold the spring and it gave the relief valve more tension and it raised the oil pressure up to where it needed to be. <laughs> but basically the spring, the relief valve spring was just a little weak in the oil pump. 
you know, it didn't have any oil pressure leaks anywhere else. And I, they drove that thing until that lumber yard, you know, I don't know where, where, where that, they drove it for a long time. There was another time he threw me one of those vehicles that had belonged to ConAgra. And uh, it was one of them just like that, same kind of truck. He says it's got a valve problem. They knew it had a burnt valve on uh, one cylinder. And uh, he says they don't want to do a whole valve job. They just want to pull the head off and they want to put this one uh, valve in there. And I hadn't been working at that shop very long. And he says it, it pays six hours. It's 10 o'clock right now. They need it back by four. Can you make it happen? And I said, well, I'll do it as quick as I can. And so uh, I pulled it in there and I rolled the cab forward and I rolled my toolbox over there where all I had to do was just reach and get my stuff. And I got my little 3 8 impact wrench and I went, where, 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 pull all that stuff apart. And I got it off and I put it on the bench and I took it apart and I put another valve in there and I lapped it in with some compound and slammed it all back together and everything and torqued it down, filled up water and fired it up before dinner. Had it done in two hours. And he was so spooked about that, he goes, they're going to think that we're putting the screws to them and that we didn't even do the job because you got it done too quick. And so he sat on it for another couple of hours after lunch before he delivered it back to them. But I mean, you know, we legitimately did what we were supposed to do. We put the valve in there. But say so he didn't want to take the time to do a valve job and he did the truck back. And he was trying to get their business back and all that. But uh, anyway, um, there was another one, a little funny story like that. My, uh, Shop foreman, uh, we were drawing these uh, a lot of a lot of these little uh, recall program tickets on some of these uh, 2.9 liters that were pulling the intake gasket in and sucking oil into the uh, intake stream, and it would you could tell that was what was wrong with it because you could see oil coming out around. I mean, it would get it would be greasy around where the exhaust manifold goes against the head, back there on the back, you know, on the uh, the last cylinder number six, and so uh, he says, uh, and I was doing a lot of drivability work then. And he says, and the shop foreman came over there. And I was getting started on one of those. He goes, what are you doing this job for? And I said, well, the dispatcher gave it to me. And I just pulled it in here and started working on it. He said, well, you got too much drivability work up there. He says, go ahead and do this one. But I'm going to tell him not to give you any more of these because these land mechanics need to be doing those. And I said, okay. He said, besides that, David Childs and Billy over here, he said, they're just starting on one of those too. And they're going to beat you if you don't hurry up, you know. Well, he was playing a head game, you know. And so anyway, I got my air ratchet and all that kind of stuff because I kind of know how to use an air ratchet well enough not to bust a bolt off, you know. Anyway, I pulled that thing off and got it all off of there and popped the gasket back on it and I was huffing and puffing and I got it all back together and I torqued everything and uh, got it all fired back up. And then I turned around to see how Billy and David were doing and they were just taking their intakes off. <laughs> they didn't know we were racing. I mean, I was racing against people that didn't know I was racing. That's why when you outrun somebody, it means they didn't know they were going to race. But I felt kind of silly because he had played, he played me, you know. <laughs> I got to beat these guys, you know, that's working really hard on that thing. But um, anyway, and let's do this. Now we're going to be done. Ignition <coughs> A says this is a dual overhead cam engine. Technician B says this is a supercharged port engine. It's correct. Tech A, tech, tech B, or both for neither. Is it a dual overhead cam engine or is it a supercharged core engine? It's not a supercharged dual overhead either. Who said that? Yeah, it is neither because the camshaft's in the center of the block. Sure is. Camshaft right there is not overhead cam. That was overhead about You see push rods, it's not overhead cam. It's not supercharged. It's not supercharged either, but it is a core engine. Which a Corvette engine is a sort of a souped up version of the 5.3 that's in these other trucks out here. And it's made it. You can see all the same stuff. It's another drawing of an engine. You know, I thought I'd throw a bit of yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Everybody have fun with that? Yep.